Good morning. I'm Andrew Jordan, and I wanted to begin a series with you teaching the basics of Talmud to some of our skeptic friends on the internet. This is a problem that I've noticed that a majority of people in the skeptical agnostic community don't really understand what the Talmud is, which is understandable, considering that the Talmud is, by definition, a specialist work that was not designed to be understood by people who didn't study it in the communities where it was meant to be studied. So I'm going to start at uh, Sepharia here, where we can find all variety of Jewish texts available online for free, oftentimes with English translation attached. So I've started in the Talmud section here, um, and we can see a brief summary of what the Talmud is. Uh, which is a textual record of generations of rabbinic debate about law, philosophy, and biblical interpretation, compiled between the 3rd and 8th centuries and structured as commentary on the Mishnah, with stories interwoven. Uh, there are two versions of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, compiled in Iraq, and what's usually called the Jerusalem Talmud, which was actually not compiled in Jerusalem, but northern Israel in the Galilee after the destruction of the temple and the uh, compilation of the Mishnah around 200 CE. So uh, there are some things that I would quibble with with this description, but it's overall pretty good um, in that the Talmud is a primarily a record, textual record, of rabbinic, uh, what I would call court proceedings of the yeshivot, which are uh, which were conceived of as the uh, rabbinic courts in Babylon and Israel, respectively. Uh, the word commentary is often used, but it's not a very good word for what the, Mish uh, what the Talmud tries to do to the Mishnah. So we start with the Mishnah over here, um, and I'm actually going to start in the Mishnah itself, and then we'll go to Talmud. Um, and so the Mishnah, of course, was compiled around 200 CE. It's a notoriously difficult text to date because it is meant to be essentially timeless, uh, as Jacob Neusner points out in his uh, introductory work on the Mishnah. Um, but it is essentially a written down form of the oral law, or the oral Torah, uh, recalling that rabbinic Jews believe that the Torah was given in two forms. And we'll actually start there uh, with the background that we really need to understand in order to jump into the uh, Talmud. And I'm just going to briefly summarize some of the um, things found here in Pirkei Avot, which, is, which literally means uh, ethics of the fathers or statements of the fathers. Um, so it's sort of a compilation of ethical teachings, but it begins with a... Uh, summary of the transmission of the Torah, uh, which we can see here um, that Moses received the Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets to the men of the great assembly. Um, and then uh, we see here sort of a summary of what they taught and they said to be patient and justice to raise up many disciples and to make a fence around the Torah. So as you go through the Talmud, you kind of have to have this in mind, that this is what the raison d'etre, as, as you might say, of the Talmud is, which is to do these three things, um, which is to be patient, or maybe you could even say lenient in justice, in applying law, in spreading these teachings among different disciples, and in making a fence around the Torah. And this is a, a crucial to understand the purpose of the Talmud and what the rabbis are doing, in that they're taking a law from the, uh, the Torah, from the written Bible, and they are uh, creating additional prohibitions around that to make it less likely that one would violate the biblical prohibition. Uh, that is essentially what rabbinic Judaism is. If you don't understand that, you won't understand anything about anything related to 
the Talmud, the Mishnah, anything from the rabbinic uh, literature. Um, and then what Pirkei Avot is going to do is going to go through and, and kind of uh, unpack the transmission and give a short, uh, either one or sometimes multiple sayings that are attributed to the people uh, in the transmission. So after the Great Assembly, we have Shimon the Righteous, Shimon HaSadiq, who was one of the last of the Great Assembly, and it says uh, what he was known for teaching, which is this here. Um, and this is also famous. These are all very famous statements um, that the world stands on three things, the Torah, the temple service, and acts of piety. Um, so that's something that you will hear uh, quite frequently. Um, and it's well known among Jews today, um, those three pillars. So this is also important to know as you see the two things here that we have. This is sort of the theory background, I guess you could say. Um, and this is the practical. So we're going to see those things throughout the, the Talmud. Um, and then it goes through and one by one you'll see different uh, pe people being mentioned and what they taught and um, what they were known for. Uh, and this goes through and you get to, so the first sort of chapter here is people that are very uh, ancient. Um, and it's not really much is known about these people. Um, sometimes these statements are the only thing that's included in their name in the entire rabbinic literature. Sometimes there's a few other stories about them. Um, and, and until you get to Hillel and Shammai, who are sort of the founders of the rabbinic era, um, and this would have been roughly contemporaneous with the life of Jesus of Nazareth around, you know, in the beginning of the first century CE, so to speak, uh, more or less. Um, the dates on these figures are very unknown, um, as we might say. Um, and then we slowly get into later throughout the rabbinic period and closer to the compilation of the Mishnah. Um, but so as we go into the Mishnah, this is an important thing to really understand. So we're going to start with the Mishnah itself over here. In Berachot. So the Mishnah is laid out into different orders, uh, which deal with the broad topic covered in these parts. So there's uh, the first one is dealing with agriculture, Zeraim. Then we have uh, Moed, Sedem Moed, which is dealing with holidays and Shabbat. Um, and then you can see here, Sede Nashim. So this is, it literally means the order of women, but what, what it's meant by that is family law. So this is marriage, divorce. Also included here is oaths um, and the tract on the, uh, being a Nazarite. Um, and if something seems out of place as to, you know, why is this in this track, in this order, you can bet that that's a big discussion in the Talmudic section as to why it was chosen to be put in this category. Uh, and then we have, next we have Sedan Ezekin, which is damages. So this is sort of like civil law. So you're going to see uh, liability, compensation, property, um, neighbor relations, sales, inheritance, the uh, judicial system, um, further kinds of oaths, um, and other things like that, as you can see here. There is Seder Kodashim, which has to do with the temple, everything with sacrifices and things like that, um, which uh, is not applicable anymore. And then we have Seder Tahorot, uh, which is um, purity, also not really in um, current practice. And then there's uh, obviously many commentaries on, on each of these works. So the, the Mishnah is actually much broader than the Talmud because the Talmud does not comment on all of the Mishnah. Uh, so in the Babylonian Talmud, there is no commentary on the agricultural laws, only on the uh, berachot, the blessings and prayers and things like that. Um, and I don't think that any, uh, either of the Talmuds really comments on the other, on the uh, sacrifices or purity in any great detail, uh, because they're not in effect with the, uh, since the destruction of the temple. Um, and it's, it's, there's, thoughts as to why maybe this was constructed with this, um, with the idea of keeping all of these, um, these things in the, um, order of the Talmud and the, I mean, the, of the Mishnah to, uh, perhaps have a manual for if the, um, temple were to be reconstructed, 
Um, and I do want to just make a quick correction with Seder Kodashim. There are, uh, the Talmuds do comment on some of these sections, um, depending on, uh, they do comment on these sections. It was more the purity section that's not um, often commented on in its entirety. Just to clarify that uh, simple mistake I made when presenting that information. Uh, so now we're going to go to the first Mishnah. I'm just going to look, open the English part for now. Uh, actually, let's just put the Hebrew here so we can see. Um, when you're looking at the Mishnah in Sepharia and the Talmud, you are uh, looking at a translation from Koran Publishers, uh, which includes the translated text from Hebrew in bold and a um, supplemental sort of... Uh, translation slash commentary included in regular text. Sometimes these are just words to kind of help fill in the uh, meaning or sometimes much longer explanations as to what's being talked about. So you can kind of see that. Um, so it starts up here and it's, this is the first chapter of the Mishnah, which is chapter Me Matai. Uh, the chapter titles of the Mishnah are usually based off the first word, uh, which is also how the Torah portions are, are known. Uh, among the rabbis. Um, so instead, to save time, we're going to just look at the English um, and go down here. So we can see, though, that uh, so it's it starts with a question. From when does one recite the Shema in the evening? That's the first question in the Mishnah. Um, and if you think that sounds strange as to why it might start like this, uh, the Mishnah has no, uh, has no introduction, no... Uh, beginning chapter that explains what it's all about. Uh, it just starts like this. Uh, from when does one recite the Shema in the evening? And if that sounds strange to you, you can uh, you can bet that it sounded strange to someone else as well. And someone has commented on that. Um, in fact, that's really the first uh, discussion in the Talmud, which is what we're going to focus on today. Um, and we can even open up over here and look at uh, one of the most famous commentaries on the Mishnah, and uh, see if he says anything about it. Uh, he does not, Bartonura does not mention that um, first question. Uh, he's going to tell us some other important things here. Uh, but we continue. So it says, from the time when the priests enter to partake of their teruma. Okay, we don't know what teruma is either um, at this this stage, but uh, we can. that's going to be important later on. Um, so then we the next statement in the Hebrew is until the end of the first watch. Um, so, and it's given us this, here to kind of help us understand uh, what's going on um, so that we know a little bit more about what what to expect here. So it says until the end of the first watch. <clears throat> and so we're going to skip the uh, commentary material here and come back to that. Uh, and so now we learn that this is the statement of uh, Ribi Eliezer. Um, and so he, th he thinks that you have until... Uh, when the priest enter to partake of the Tirumah at the end of the first watch, that's what you have uh, to recite the Shema. There are a lot of things that the Mishnah is assuming you understand when you go into this, which I'm going to unpack in a minute. But first, I'm just going to read through the Mishnah. Uh, so then we have the rabbis, which means the sort of collective, uh, collegial voice of all the rabbis together. This happens quite frequently, that the, the rabbis will, uh, or hachamim in Hebrew, will respond to a statement of an individual rabbi. Um, and they, they say that you have until midnight. And then we have another opinion, which is Rabban Gamaliel, who says that you have until dawn. Okay, so there's three different statements here. Uh, and we're going to actually just pause for a second and go back and look at some things. So the Mishnah is uh, essentially the recorded oral Torah. Um, it's important to know that there's a prohibition to write down the writ, uh, oral Torah uh, so you might be asking if there's a prohibition to write it down, why is it written down? Um, and essentially what you uh, would have to understand is that there was a sort of an emergency decree made that you can write this down um, in this only this one case. Um, there's going to be a number of different opinions as to uh, everything that I say. So you, if you know of a different approach, that's kind of part of the game that there's not really one um single understanding of everything, but this is how I was taught and how I understand it, um, that the, there was one 
moment that it was allowed to write down the oral Torah, and that is the Mishnah, basically. Um, and so after that point, there's really no, you're not still supposed to write it down. But you'll notice that the Mishnah has a quality about it where it's uh, sort of anticipated that you come to learn Mishnah already knowing certain things. Um, and also it's the kind it's a kind of text that you can't really study on your own without having rely on a teacher at some point. Um, in modern times, we do have access to all of the commentaries and things like that. Uh, but it's really, uh, you can't uh, supplement the experience of being taught by someone, the Mishnah and the, and the Talmud, um, because there's just this quality to it of, of learning from someone. So when we look at the first uh, issue that we're discussing here, we have to know a certain number of things. We have to know what is the Shema. We have to know what is Teruma. We need to understand what is the first watch. Um, we also kind of need to understand who some of the people are here. Um, and so that's a lot for it's asking of us. So I'm going to do uh, exit out of this for a second and go to the Sidur, the prayer book. And I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to look at the Shema so we just understand what that actually is. The Shema is a series of prayers that are recited, uh, or not pr uh, prayers is not really perhaps the best word, but uh, included in the prayers uh, for each day. Um, and as we'll see, it's going to be something that we do in the uh, more, uh, evening and the morning. That's the question that we have. Um, so let's find where it starts here. Okay, so here's the Shema. And in Hebrew, it will be Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Um, and so this is a passage from uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. And it's, Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one. Um, there's a number of different ways you can translate that, and that's not really the focus here. But uh, So it's sort of um, something like a declaration of affirmation. Uh, belief is not really the right word, but uh, sort of a, yeah, a de declaration, affirmation uh, is probably the best way. Um, so it's not just this one statement. This is Shema. This is the first part of it. But when we say Shema, we're actually meaning a, a series of paragraphs. So the second paragraph is the Ve'ahafta, based off the first word here, um, which is also from uh, Deuteronomy. And you can see it's down here, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, might. And these words which I command you this day upon your heart, etc., etc. So you can read it here on the screen. Um, and this is probably quite famous to you. You might have heard uh, this. I believe it's also used in Christian prayer to a certain extent. Um, someone can correct me on that if that's incorrect. Uh, and it goes further down here to the next paragraph, which is also from Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 11. And this one, it starts, and, you sh and it shall be that if you hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain for you, for your land in, in its proper time, the autumn rain and the spring rain, that you may gather in your grain, your wine and your oil, and you can continue to see that this is sort of a reward and punishment type of text uh, in encouraging the people of Israel to keep the commandments of the Torah. And the last paragraph of the uh, Shema is over here. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, Make for themselves a fringe on the corner of their garments throughout their generations. And then, so this is talking about the uh, talit, which is the um, tzitzit, which is attached to the talit. So uh, the tzitzit are the uh, strings that are you might have seen um, on a, a Jewish prayer shawl, which is what it's talking about here. Um, and there's reasons for why that is. This is actually from Numbers and not Deuteronomy. Um, and so uh, that are not important, but this is something that's worn during the morning prayer. So now we understand the Shema, we're going to go back to the Mishnah for a second and continue looking at this. I'm showing you the text from the Mishnah first, um, just to uh, access some of these commentaries uh, on the Mishnah. Um, so it's going to explain over here a little bit about 
um, the Kohanim, the priests, um, which is really, I'm going to just kind of show it on the screen. Um, the Tirumah is a kind of tax, I guess you could say, um, that's put on agricultural pro uh, produce. Um, and it's really referring to the time of day uh, when priests would eat this. Uh, they have sort of are given a, a percentage of the agricultural uh, yield, uh, sort of crops for the year and that kind of thing. And they uh, they eat that uh, as part of that's kind of one of the benefits, I suppose you could say, of being a priest. You get to have teruma, and they eat it at a certain point. And that's what he's explaining over here. Um, and let's see if there's anything else that we... Uh, well, we, yes, we need to know the uh, the first watch, so that's going to be explained over here, uh, which is how they would divide the night into different watches. Okay, that seems pretty important to know. And um, <clears throat> I'm just scrolling through and seeing if there's anything else we really need to know. Um, well, let's go down and, and continue. So we, we set up the debate between Rabbi Eliezer, who says it's from until the priest partake their Turma, the rabbis say until midnight, and Rabban Gamliel says until dawn. Okay, interesting. We have a three-way sort of debate here. And then there's a story. Okay, they're going to tell us a story that's going to serve as a point here. So there was an incident with the sons of Rabban Gamliel. They were at a wedding, and they were having a good time. Um, and they talked to him, and they were saying, we didn't recite Shema. Do we still have time, basically, to do to say it? Um, and he says to them, based off his opinion, which is that you have until dawn, he says, okay, you can do that if dawn is not, if it's not dawn yet. So you still have, can say the evening Shema. That's what it's, the question is. Um, and so, he, and then he kind of makes a statement that he says, and so whenever the sages are talking about that you have until midnight, what they really mean is that you have until dawn. But they're kind of like, pushing you to do it a little earlier so you don't get into the situation like like they did here when they were you know out having a good time and they forgot um the the this is uh going to be kind of like a fence almost around the torah they're saying you have until dawn but you can uh but we're saying until midnight just to kind of encourage you to do it earlier so you don't get into this situation um and i'm actually going to skip over some of this this stuff here it's not super important um this is uh, if you really want to read this, you could come back and kind of look at this. Um, but then down here we have at the end. If so, why do the sages say that you can uh, that you can eat until that you have until midnight? And so this is what I was just saying that it's order to distance a person from transgression. So like if you believe that you have only until midnight, you'll get it done earlier. But if you say you have until dawn, you'll wait until the last minute. Um, so this is uh, some interesting points here that the rabbis are pretty cognizant of uh, human behavior um, and accepting of it in a way that's not prevalent in other religious communities. Um, so they're very cognizant that people tend to procrastinate and want to wait until the last minute. So they have sort of built this into the legal system. Um, and you can see here the principles of uh, being lenient in justice. So they want to give you extra time, but they want you to kind of um, also at the same time not rely on that too much. So you're allowed to say the evening Shema until the morning, but we really kind of prefer you do it by midnight. So you can see the principles that we were seeing in Peter Kavold at work here. So this is the Mishnah written around 200. Let's do one more thing before we go to the Talmud. Uh, first, which is to go down here and check the Tosefta. Now the Tosefta is sort of a, um, it's kind of complicated, but it's it's there's a few different versions of how to understand what it is. Um, I tend to like what uh, I believe Judith Hauptman, uh, maybe that I've, I'm not a, exactly certain on the first name, but Hauptman is is a scholar who sort of has applied some of the principles of synoptic research to the rabbinic literature and uses the Mishnah and the Tosefta and compares them together to try to find what we might call the Ur Mishnah, the early Mishnah, uh, to sort of deduce if there's any way that we could figure out the sources of these materials. Um, and we do know that, they're, that the rabbis took notes um, according to what they have in the um, in the Talmud. We have records of, of referencing to each rabbi taking notes, and it's kind of presumed that maybe that's what is behind the Mishnah. Uh, but we, what we essentially want to do here is just check and see what the Tosefta is saying about this. 
Um, so I'm going to try to line these up like this. So the Tosefta begins uh, the same thing, Mimatai, from when do we read Shema in the evening? Same question. It's got plural instead of singular. Evenings, evening. Uh, that's interesting. Um, and then it says, from the time when people come home to eat their bread on Shabbat nights. And they're, so they have a different statement here. So we have the statement of uh, Ribi Eliezer, and they have Ribi Meir. Um, so that's interesting. And the Hahamim say that we have um, from the time when the Kohanim are able to eat their Terumah. So here they put the, the Hahamim saying this one, which we know as uh, Rabbi Eliezer. Um, and then we have something about a sign for this is coming out of the stars. And even though there is no explicit proof for this matter, there is an indirect reference. So it's, it's very different over here. Um, you can just see that, uh, and the other approach to understanding Tosefta is that it's sort of a uh, compendium of kind of an alternative Mishnah of things that uh, didn't make it into the Mishnah. Um, so this, you can see that also at work here with the different opinions approach, uh, being presented. Um, but it can be helpful just to understand different approaches and seeing what um, is presented to other rabbis and what they might have said. Um, but now let's go over to the Talmud. Okay, here we go. Uh, so as we said, there are two different versions of the Talmud. But typically when someone is talking about the Talmud, they mean the Babylonian Talmud. Um, we will look at the Jerusalem for a second. I mean, we're just going to look at kind of parts of it here. So we already did the Mishnah. Uh, that's what we were just looking at. And it has the Mishnah over here in the Talmud. The same Mishnah just um, built into the text. So you can see we left off right here uh, in order to distance a person from transgression. That's the point of the story we were just reading. So now we start with the Gemara, which is the Talmud part of the Talmud, if that makes sense. Uh, this is what's in, in addition to the Mishnah. And this is what they call the commentary, uh, which is not a good word, but... We'll just stick with that for now. So uh, the Gemara starts with the question, um, you know, why do we start with this question? Uh, why are we starting here? This is the beginning of the Mishnah. This is our big work. Why do we start with this question? Um, it seems kind of like uh, maybe we should have first said maybe this is what the Shema is and, you know, you have to say it two times a day and et cetera, et cetera. But no, we just start with a question sort of kind of in the middle of the of the the debate we didn't start from the beginning more or less so the gamara says that it says you know why do we start like this this is kind of kind of strange um and so and and the second part of that question is so why do we start with this question and why do we start with the evening that doesn't make a lot of sense either um why don't we start with the morning first you know why not the morning that makes more sense we kind of tend to think of it that way like we wake up and then um it's the morning and then it's the evening. But here we started with the evening first. Why do we do that? That doesn't make a lot of sense either. Um, so it says that, okay, so they say we're going to offer some proofs to kind of help you understand why we started it this way. So the Tana, this is the this is a, the group of guys who used to memorize the Mishnah. And it seems like they were just around to uh, sort of be the, you know, kind of your computer at that time when you were debating these texts. They would call up the Tana and say, the guy who memorized this part, can you kind of repeat the Mishnah for us so we can, you know, talk about it a little more and remember what it says. Um, so the Tana, he, uh, he uh, they're referring the person who, the, re repeating the Mishnah Tana means to repeat. Uh, so he, he talks about in Mishnah, this is, so we're referring back to the Mishnah basically. Um, so what is the proof? Like, what, how do uh, how do we know that we should start from the evening? What, what's the point of this, right? So uh, it's going to tell us, point us to one of the verses of the of the Shema, which is the first uh, part in the Ve'ahavta, the the, par the first paragraph that we read after the Shema part. Um, and so it has a part about you will talk of them, the commandments, when you sit down in your in your home and when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you arise. So it's saying, okay, we're doing this because it says it in the text. It says that you lie down first, evening, and you then you rise, morning. So we're starting in that order. So we're uh, that's that's why we're that's one answer for why we're doing it like this. Okay, and you can see in some of this background commentary that it's also kind of pointing to the oral Torah. We're setting up the flavor of what this is with the oral Torah and the uh, nature of where you need to kind of understand a lot of different moving parts to really dive into this. Um, 
And so the next section is that we um, want to look here, and it says, and the Tana teaches, again, back to the Mishnah, when is the time for the recitation of the Shema of lying down as commanded in the Torah? So it's kind of a different way of phrasing it with using this language from the written Torah of when you lie down, the Shema of lying down, right? Um, and so we say from when the priests enter to take partake of the teruma. And that's going to point us to the next thing that we're going to talk about down here. Uh, but first we also want to there's an additional proof to help us understand why we're doing the order of evening then morning, okay? So the uh, second proof text that is given, <coughs> excuse me, is to look from a different passage, uh, which is in Genesis talking about the creation of the world. And we know in that story that uh, it always says there was evening and there was morning, day one, day two, day three. So it's saying this is also an additional way you could understand as to why we're doing it like this. Why do we start with the evening and not the morning? That's the question. And so then we go down here. We're going we're gonna to stop here pretty soon, but I'm just kind of figuring out where we want to stop. But um, so it's going to ask a different question. So we kind of resolve that. Here's your two proof texts. This is explaining why we do it like this. It's kind of looping us into the the rhythm that we want to understand. And it's uh, so we're basing it on the written Torah and we're applying that to our understanding of oral Torah, basically. So we go over here and the next question is um, going to ask us about something that happens later. Um, it's referencing a later Mishnah which if we click over here, we can figure out what that is. <coughs> Maybe. Uh, here it is, Mishnah. Okay. So it's telling us over here, it's going to point to the later Mishnah, uh, which is 1-4, and it's talking about the blessings that you do before and after. Okay. So it's like, uh, so in the morning, we recite two blessings and one blessing afterwards, in the evening, one and then two. Um, I read mean, two and then two, sorry. Um, so... They should have said, um, so it says here, they should have taught the blessing recited before and after the Shema instead of just launching into this question, right? We should have kind of spent some time on this. So you can see we're critiquing the Mishnah. And it's kind of important to understand, too, that the Mishnah was written in a very um, sort of, they sacrificed the, the language to make it shorter. Um, so there's a lot of times when the Mishnah is sort of unclear, um, or maybe they think it's missing a word or something like that, and they want to kind of unpack it and understand. Um, but you can see here there's a lot of questions about the Mishnah, and the whole point of the Mishnah is to really kind of make you ask those questions. You know, why did they do it like this? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So um, here it's saying, you know, maybe we should have started over with this and spent a little bit more time to understand um, the kind of the background material first. But we have, um, here's the answer. So it says the Tanah began um, talking about the evening. And then we taught the laws about the morning next. So when he was dealing with the morning, he explains about the morning. But here we're talking about the evening. So we're going to talk about the evening. Um, yeah. And so it's going to continue. And we're going to talk about the Teruma a little bit. So you can see it kind of jumps from, it'll talk about the issue and then once that's kind of resolved, then it goes and jumps to the next thing um, without really like a transition. So if you're reading this on like an actual page of Talmud, uh, which I was going to show you in this video, but I might save that for a diff the next video. Um, you, it's, it's kind of, you can see that you would need someone to help you understand a little bit of what, uh, how to break this down. Um, the way we read it here in Safari is a little easier, especially with the commentary to help us understand uh, what it's kind of what's missing in the text, um, but it's it still doesn't beat the experience of studying with someone. Okay, so we go and we're going to talk about the next thing about the um, the period in the evening uh, when we recite Shema, and we uh, are talking about the Teruma again. So we're going to go back to that, um, which is not really a time; it's just kind of like a general statement. So um, when is when is that basically? That's kind of the question, and the answer has to do with um, when you can see stars. So if you think about the ancient 
world and uh, you know they didn't have clocks and things like that in the same way that we do um, so they had to rely on natural signs and the way you knew it was nighttime was that you could see stars basically um, and so you'll see that throughout the Talmud that these kind of um, definitions are used uh, and we have to kind of apply that to modern precise times that we have um, and so he says you know if that's the answer then why didn't you just say from the emergence of the stars. So we're going to see what they say about that. Um, and it's going to go into kind of, actually, this might actually be a little bit more than what we want to do because it goes into more than probably what we want to spend time on. it. So this is actually a pretty good time to stop because you can kind of get the flavor of what it is to see here. Um, and before we uh, conclude, I just want to show you the Jerusalem Talmud for a second. Uh, this is actually the earlier Talmud. Um, it's kind of often assumed that the Jerusalem Talmud is a little bit less edited, a little more choppy, uh, kind of harder to understand. Um, so we'll see how it's a little different. Um, and so you can see here it has its Mishnah, and then they call it a Halacha over here, kind of like a law instead of Gemara. Um, but we have the same the same Mishnah, basically what we were just talking about. And then over here, the Jerusalem Talmud starts with the same kind of question, you know, why do you start with the evening, you know, um, like the same question we saw earlier. Uh, and they say, here you can see they have a lot more notes to kind of help you um, understand it. So you can click on those and unpack what it says here. Um, so they have, so they say, okay, from the time that the priests entered to eat their terumah, back to the terumah, they have a different rabbis in 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 the Jerusalem Talmud, because different rabbis lived in Israel versus Babylonia. But Rabbi Hiya says, okay, from the time that people enter their houses on Friday night to eat their meal, which uh, was in the Tosefta, if you were paying close attention, but it was attributed to Rabbi Meir. Um, so it's going to explain some of that in here, uh, but we're not going to dive too much into that. Um, so they say, okay, those opinions are identical. Let's see, what does it say? Come and see. Uh, from the time that the priests enter their teruma, is still daylight, and the stars have not, and the stars start to appear. Okay, and then so then we look at the other one from the time that people enter their houses Friday evening eat their meals. This is kind of one or two hours, and so, so it's kind of later in the evening, right? So you want to say these are almost identical. Rabbi Yosef says, explain it to people, explain it to people by saying that in how uh, explain it by people in hamlets who usually leave the roads when there's still daylight. Okay, so this is kind of just unpack. The whole point of this is to try to figure out when is the time frame. But you can see the discussion is quite different. Um, it goes down a different path than what we did in, in the Babylonian Talmud. And it is a, a bit harder to understand. Um, and just reading it here, it's, it's, it's more compact. Um, you really kind of need to understand what is being stated um, to understand what it means. Um, and so they go down a different path of, of uh, explaining it and what it means. So you can just see that it's different. The Jerusalem Talmud is different. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to start with today. Um, what I essentially want to do is um, look through a series of important passages of Talmud, which help explain what it is, um, how to understand it, and um, what its purpose is. And in this one, we saw all the principles that we were applying from Peter Kavot, which is the um, being lenient and justice, so really providing that long window of time for you to do your obligation, which is something that's always also not mentioned when I mean, I'm just thinking about it. Uh, but there's an obligation to recite the Shema two times a day. Um, but it, as part of the oral nature of this, this is something you're kind of presumed to already know when you go into the Talmud. So the question is, um, you know, how much time do I have to recite the evening Shema? And the answer is you have until dawn, but we're going to tell you until midnight so that you don't run into the situation like the sons of Rabban Gamliel who were uh, out too late and almost missed their chance, right? So that's kind of the also uh, putting a fence around the Torah, the two principles that we saw. And then in the Gemara, you can see questions of, you know, why uh, questioning the Mishnah, the way it's written. Why was it written like this? Uh, why don't we start with 
um, something a little bit more explanatory. Why don't we explain the obligation of Shema? What is the Shema? How many, what texts are included in the Shema? Um, a lot of those questions are going to be answered later in the Talmud, but um, the question is, why did we not start it like that? We kind of started it in the middle of the debate, and we assumed that people know quite a bit and have come into it. Um, and maybe that's kind of the intended purpose, but um, then the Gemara and, and Bab the Babylonian Talmud gave a number of uh, proof texts, uh, you know, because it's in the text of the Shema itself, which says in the evening and in the morning, or the creation story, which says evening and morning, the first day. Uh, these were the two... Uh, proof texts that were offered. Um, and from that brief sort of introduction to the Talmud, you can see the flavor of what it's trying to do. Um, and so that's all that I have for today. I hope that you found this interesting. My plan is to, to go through famous passages of the Talmud with you uh, to serve as an introduction to what the Talmud is and why it's important. But that's all for today. Have a nice day.